Today we're going to do a detailed discussion of drug movements through the body, or in another prettier word, pharmacokinetics. The first thing, let's imagine for a second here that we are a drug. Um, our first and main goal is to reach our site of action, where we need to be. But if we look at what happens once a drug is absorbed, most drugs will have to enter the cell to have their effect there, um, at their site of action. So when the drug is absorbed into the bloodstream, it's going to travel around the body. And most of those drugs are going to enter the cell through this method called passive diffusion. So passive diffusion does not cost the cell any energy. And we can basically look at the process right here, which is as time goes by, we will naturally reach an equilibrium on both sides of the cell membrane, the lipid bilayer. So as we see in this third and final phase here, we will have an approximately equal amount of drug outside of the cell membrane, as well as inside of the cell membrane. So this would also immediately lead you to understand the way we can get as much, much more of the drug inside here is by raising the dose. Because if we got more of a total dose, we're gonna have more, we're gonna have a higher equilibri equilibrium that's going to diffuse into the cell. All right, so let's look at our overview for what's gonna happen. Um, the first decision we need to make when we are prescribing any medication is how are we gonna administer this drug? And I've written down here, just kind of quickly, the main routes of administration, which are IV, IM, so intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, per PO, which stands for per os, which is orally, and then there's topical, and then there's inhalation. Um, let's talk a little bit about oral administration first. Oral administration is pretty great because it's safe, convenient, and cheap. So this method really has a lot going for it, um, but there's also a lot of buts with this method, um, which are going to not make it useful in any situation. So let's discuss these. It's safe, convenient, and cheap, but the stomach has an acidic environment, as you all know, and this could together with enzymes, digestive enzymes, this could have a bad effect on the drug and they might destroy the drug. So that way we are not actually getting the medication absorbed at all, so that's a failed treatment. Um, some drugs can be irritative to the gastric mucosa, and the presence of food can actually, the presence of food can actually influence the absorption of certain drugs, um, and some drugs are metabolized extensively by the liver the first time around when they're absorbed. And this is what we call the first pass effect. So this is an important one. So I'm just gonna elaborate on it a little bit over here. The first, so we got our liver here. The first pass effect basically works like this. We got our medication, right? We're going in here, bam, 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 into the stomach, having a pretty good time. Um, we're moving into like the small intestine and we get absorbed into the portal vein. So we end up at the liver and the liver is the big filtration organ. So filtration, you know, clean that stuff up. And so certain medications will be filtered out more than 70, 80% of their concentration in the liver. And because of that, not actually reach any valuable concentration level inside the systemic circulation. And this is what we call the first pass effect. So... Drugs that are extensively filtered out like this, we have to either give very high doses or we want to actually consider another route of administration. So moving to the next one, IV, IM, and SC, together we call these parental, parenteral administration. And let's discuss, discuss that one a little bit. This is great because it's rapid onset, <clears throat> more uniform absorption, and much more predictable. Um, and if we're talking about speed, then obviously intravenous is going to be the fastest, followed by intramuscular, followed by subcutaneous. So IV will have an almost immediate effect. Um, these can be used as opposed to oral medication in an animal that's unconscious or in an animal that's vomiting. Both of these, pretty common if we're talking about treatment and medication situations, uh, will actually completely make it unable for us to use oral medication. But parental administration is still available for us. However, our butts here are the following. Asepsis, 
so we need to you know keep everything really clean this costs time and manpower obviously um and the rapid onset can sometimes lead to cardiovascular side effects making certain medications not really a good fit for this type of administration um if we look at our other other administration routes topical and inhalation topical uh, our medication the absorption is going to depend here on the lipid solubility of the drug. So if it's very lipid soluble, as you know, the, the, cell bi the lipid bilayer, only lipid soluble medication can diffuse through it. So if a drug is very lipid soluble, then it will be able to be absorbed pretty effectively from the skin. Um, and a pretty popular example here is the fentanyl dermal patch. And for inhalation, we use this for like gaseous anesthetics, like halothane. Um, all right, so let's talk. Let's let's get going with our, our little scheme that I'm laying out here. So we've chosen to administer our medications. Got I am S C P O topical or inhalation, and all of these will have to be absorbed. So we got absorption here. And once they are absorbed, we're going to move into our next area in the body, which is going to be the plasma. So our drug is going to be absorbed, and then it's going to be in the plasma, bam, as free drug traveling around. You can see I did not put IV. I didn't connect it to the absorption category because... IV medication don't have to be absorbed because they are put straight into the plasma. So IV is going, we have our free drug straight in the plasma right here. And something that can occur to the drug while it's in the plasma is that it will be bound to plasma proteins. And as I'm highlighting here, this process kind of goes this is an similarly an equilibrium process, um, but it will not necessarily rest at a 50-50 pace. So whether a drug will bind to plasma protein is really dependent on the character of the drug. Some of them tend to have more than 80% of the drug concentration bound to plasma protein, and some other ones don't really bind to plasma proteins at all. But it's important for us to know about this because binding or not binding is going to have some consequences to how our medication works. So let's take a moment to look into plasma protein binding over here. Um, yeah, as I was talking about, there is going to be a back and forth between a drug, a protein bound drug and free drug. Now, I mentioned earlier during the passive diffusion part that we will most likely achieve an equilibrium here that's going to be a 50-50 split of the concentration. However, a drug that is protein bound cannot cross membranes. So that means all of our protein bound drugs cannot move out of the blood vessels. So they are staying in the blood vessels. Well, the free drug is still capable of crossing. So it will only be an equilibrium between the amount of free drug in this picture. That's five of them, which means we can expect two and a half to, you know, move into the extracellular space over here. And all the drug that is currently bound to these proteins is not able to move across there at all. So this does not actually prevent the drug from reaching the site of action. So the drug still works, but it will slow down the rate. At which we reach, at which the drug reaches a sufficient concentration to produce our effect. So it's actually going to take a bit longer. And there's something else that we need to keep in mind when we have a strongly, strongly protein bound drug. Um, they can't be filtered by the kidney. So can't be filtered. But obviously keep in mind, it's not going to stay around forever because what's going to happen is as more of this free drug is moving out of the blood vessels, bam, more of these little drugs protein bound are going to dissociate and then become free drugs. As we are pointing out here, this is a constantly 
you know, a constant equilibrium where the more free drug is moving out, the more drugs are dissociating from their protein carrier as well. So it's still going to ultimately reach its site. It's just going to take longer. And so these drugs can't be filtered while they're protein bound. And this is important for us to keep in mind if we're giving two drugs that are both highly protein bound, specifically if they compete for the same protein. Uh, in this case, we need to think of some toxicity issues because if both if both of these want to go for the same protein, then you'll obviously understand um, we will have a higher level of free drug than we were expecting uh, in case we give this drug on its own because they have to compete for the same amount of protein. And this could be dangerous in case, for example, in digitalis because if this is even slightly higher in concentration in the plasma, that's going to actually be toxic for our patient. So we have in our plasma, we have our drug that is free and we have our drug that is bound to our plasma protein. And so let's see where our drug can actually distribute to. Now that we're in the plasma, the free drug can just go and scooch right in here. And this is our, whoops, our site of action. So this is where we want it to go all along, right? This is where we want it to be. And it's wonderful that our drug made it here. Uh, so here what happens as well is we have our free drug and it's going to have a really fun interaction with the receptor that it's been looking for all along that we wanted it to reach. And then keep in mind that this is also continuously moving back. So this, this traveling through the body is not a process that is one step after the other. Um, it is the culmination of all these things happening at the same time that is going to tell us how the concentration is moving around. So um, something that can also happen is that our drug moves into tissue deposits, which are over here. So maybe it just binds to, um, here again, our free drug moves in here and then it can go and maybe it binds to some bone tissue or anything like that. Um, and in that case, it's going to kind of hang around there until that bond uh, disintegrates. And then it can go and move back and once again be free drug. So um, what's gonna happen next is, I mean, not next in that order, so to say, uh, but obviously we're traveling all around the body right now and we will inevitably encounter the liver. So our free drug, bam encounters the liver and in this liver biotransformation takes place. So the liver is actually going to change our medication a little bit. And I hear you asking, why is it going to change our medication? And that is a very good question. And the answer is, we're just gonna zoom in on our little metabolism tab right here and go over it. Um, I'm going to explain it, it's the following. Lipid soluble drugs. will be reabsorbed in the kidney. So it's actually tough for our body to get rid of lipid soluble drugs. So what the liver is going to do, it's going to do a two phase biotransformation to make the drug more water soluble. So it's gonna attach certain chemical groups to it to make it more water soluble so that it can be more e effectively excreted by kidney. So this is our process of metabolization. Our liver is going to come in and change, change a little bit how this drug looks chemically. And so back in our plasma, after that happens, we're gonna have our metabolites. That is the resulting chemicals that, that are the results from when our original drug has been metabolized by the liver. So we call them metabolites now. Um, now you should not immediately assume that this process is equal to deactivation of the drug because that's not the case. Um, often the drug will be deactivated after having been metabolized, but it is also pretty common that the metabolites themselves are actually pharmacologically active, and so they will have an effect on their own. And there are even certain drugs 
that when we give them in the form that is absorbed and then travels in the plasma, it does not have an active effect. We call this a prodrug. And then only once it reaches the liver, the liver actually turns it into this metabolite, which will have the active effect. An example for this is codeine, which is not that effective on its own, but once it reaches the liver, it will be transformed into morphine, which is much better at painkilling. So this is what we call a pro-drug, when we actually just want the liver to do the work for us and make the drug. Uh, let's, let me add a bit, bit onto metabolism here. Um, so this happens in the liver and it can be influenced by other drugs in case of enzyme induction. This is what happens, so imagine um, we use a certain medication, it reaches the liver, and the liver starts to produce a bunch of enzyme, um, specifically to degrade in this two-phase biotransformation, right, to metabolize this medication. And then if we happen to afterwards, soon after, give another medication that is degraded, metabolized by the same enzyme, then at this point, this enzyme will be induced, which means there's a heightened amount of this enzyme present because it was already mass produced to tackle that other drug we just gave. So at this point, our second drug is going to be metabolized much quicker than we would normally expect. This is enzyme induction. Um, and obviously the metabolism is influenced by age. So the young, the old are particularly not very good at doing this. Um, and it's also influenced by the presence of liver or kidney disease in which our patient is also going to be less capable of doing this. And there are some species differences for example, if we look at cats, they have very low abilities to glucuronidate, which basically makes them very susceptible to aspirin toxicity because they can't really break that down. So that's a little species specific thing here. So we're going to we've got we've been we've had metabolism happening. Our drug has been deposited mostly all around the body. Um, though not everywhere, because I do want to mention that we have a few special barriers in the body, like the CNS, it's protected by what we like to call the BBB, which is for blood brain barriers, so the infamous BBB. Not all drugs can easily enter the CNS, which is good because it's an area that we really want to have protected. Um, in the same way, the placenta is a special barrier and not, not all drugs are able to cross this barrier. And we also have some more special barriers, a testicular one, a prostate one, which is kind of funny, and an eye globe one. Um, but this CNS, the BBB, and the placental barrier are really the most important ones that we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with a pregnant animal or when we need to get medication into the CNS, we need to choose a specific one that's going to be able to get there. So far we have discussed um, three of our pharmacologic pillars. So we've gone over absorption, we've gone over dis <clears throat> distribution, we've gone over metabolism, and now we're going to discuss excretion. We discussed already that this metabolism happens so that the body can so that the body can get rid of the drug better, and that's what we're going over in this last Oh, straight through metabolites. Bam, and the metabolites, which are also present in the plasma, will obviously also encounter the kidney. Um, excretion here, which is done by mainly the kidney and actually a little bit the bile. So, interesting. Um, let's look at our excretion. So, I mentioned the lipid soluble ones are reabsorbed, so they stay in the plasma. Um, and urinary pH is also going to play a big role in which drugs are going to be filtered out because a drug is more likely to follow its likes. So if we're talking about acidic drugs, you know, drugs that are weak acids like NSAIDs, they're more likely to be filtered out in the urine. And let's take a moment to talk about the bile, which came as a surprise to me when I learned that. So the bile can actually excrete, but it's less effective than the kidneys why, you might say, well, because afterwards, it this can still be reabsorbed um, in the intestines. So we actually might be, you know, excreting it and then absorbing once again, uh, this same medication. And what we call this enterohepatic circulation. This is the reason that chocolate, which contains theobromin, 
is so toxic to dogs because it is actually excreted through the bile and then it enters the enterohepatic circulation. And because it keeps kind of going around and around instead of just leaving the body, the half-life for theobromine is actually 17 hours in the dog. So that's a long time for a lot of this medication to accumulate and cause toxic effects. All right, so we've discussed our four pillars of pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Um, we've made our little map here, which is really going to show you how the medication can travel around the body and how it's interacted with by the body. And I hope you enjoyed this video and have a good day.